thanks to the, the organizing team for having me, for inviting me here to deliver this talk. So, uh, I've been doing this for almost like five years now. This is the, the job that I'm doing right now. And uh, one question that, that I always have encountered, of course, it is coming down quite a bit these days because people have started to get a, a hang of it. I mean, uh, I, I won't say that anybody is an expert in this, but, uh, but then uh, the knowledge and the, the awareness on, on how do I adopt AI, how do I adopt deep learning, how do I adopt machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. These are the, I would say, the most uh, misused terms in the, in the industry today. I mean, uh, everybody wants to do something about it. They are feeling a bit scared that, hey, my computer talks something which I don't understand. How come I'm not uh, um, using it? But the irony of the situation is businesses are running good. It's not that businesses are suffering. I mean, um, people have been doing good stuff for the past 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, and businesses are doing good. But still, there's some sort of pressure, you know, to, to, to adopt something which is, uh, which is esoteric, which is like unknown. So how, do I, how exactly do I? Do I do that? What's the, what are the best ways and what is the best way to ramp up if you are interested in getting AI into your organization and how do I build an AI first organization? Um, that's, that's going to be the focus of my talk for the next uh, um, 38 minutes or so. Alright, so let's take a step back. Uh, let's do some uh, 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 a quick look at that history, a very quick look, a couple of minutes early. So, the, the definition of data sciences has changed drastically in the last seven to eight years' time. Heuristic analytic techniques, which are like time-proven, no issues about it, you, you give the right programming, you do, you do the right uh, rules, you give the right rules, if then yes, it's simple, and whatever comes out is explainable, you know what's happening, e e fantastic, working fine, it will work fine for many more years to come. Then comes machine learning. Um, so, machine learning, the biggest, I would say, I don't want to call it as a limitation, the biggest feature of machine learning is that most of the time, you need to use structured data, right? But unfortunately, you can take any domain, I mean, it could be healthcare or uh, IoT or whatever, I mean, take any domain. Uh, on an average, about 80% of the data happens to be unstructured data. So, when you're using machine learning techniques, which, which basically what it means is that, if object, let's say object identification, the simplest task uh, today, is my agenda. The, the feature engineering, which is extracting the features of the object, which help me to understand what this object is, is done through manual techniques. You got to be a domain expert, you need to understand the object inside out, and you need to define, you need to extract the features by handcrafting the features. Feature engineering is done through manual techniques. That has been, that is the way machine learning works. So, because of the inherent nature of data that is available to us, which, which as I meant, on, on average, I mean, it may vary a little bit here and there, but about 80% of the data happens to be unstructured data. That means, for that particular domain, 80% of the available data cannot be used effectively. It's not that it can never be used. cannot be used that effectively when you are using the conventional machine learning techniques, right? Does it mean that conventional machine learning techniques are bad? Absolutely no. I mean, they are extremely good. We will touch upon them a bit later. And then comes deep learning. You'll be surprised to know that deep learning has been there for about 30, 40 years now. It's nothing new. But we all heard about it only like seven, eight years ago. And there's a reason for that. I'll come to it a bit later. So in deep learning, instead of doing the feature engineering through, through manual techniques, instead of handcrafting the features, what you do is you use large amounts of data, huge amounts of data, and you, and you write algorithms that enable the machine to look at the data learn from the data and understand the patterns and the commonalities that are hidden inside the data. Right? And we use the techniques called neural networks for, for achieving that. So, the biggest, um, I would say, the, the advantage that deep learning brought into, into the uh, world of AI is this. You are able to use unstructured data also in addition to structured data for making your decisions. Right? So, actionable intelligence that you get from a data became much, much more profound because of the ability to use unstructured data, which happens to be about 80% of the data available for that particular domain, right? No, it makes sense yet until now. So, so this has changed a lot uh, in the way AI has been working for very long, and um, it is because of this big change that deep learning brought into this world that we are all having here, I'm, I'm talking and you are all listening to me only because of this. Okay, if not for this, it would not happen. 
Now, one, 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 um, I would say, um, uh, uh, a statement that I want to make is, I mean, deep learning is a methodology to do machine learning, right? I mean, the slide makes it look like if machine learning is one and deep learning is something totally different animal, it's not. Uh, if machine learning is the bigger circle, deep learning is a smaller circle, a subset that contained in the machine learning, okay? So when I say machine learning, what I mean is the classical machine learning and deep learning is deep learning, right? I mean, just to be, let's be aware of that. All right. So, thanks to these technologies, whatever I have meant, thanks to these developments, what I have talked about, I mean, I would say that there is a redundant slide. Redundant slide. I assume that all of you guys know about this. I mean, maybe this slide would have been, um, would have made sense three years ago, but not today. It's there everywhere today, right? I mean, from the recommendation engines to, 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 to the shirts that you are served uh, to, be, to, to choose when you are going to a e commerce website, to, the, to speech, to translation. I am talking in English, you want to hear it in Telugu or Marathi or Tamil or Mayalam or Mandarin or Spanish, anything is possible. I mean, in almost in real time, nothing is real time. To, to medical imaging uh, uh, techniques and uh, entertainment and um, uh, security and defense, a huge thing for, for adoption of, uh, of AI techniques today. And last but not the least, the epitome of deep learning is, is autonomous machines, right? It's, it's, it's an amazing te technique. I mean, the, the good things that we are talking about, driverless cars and things like that, it's all thanks to, thanks to deep learning. Because when, when we drive, I mean, there is so much complex things that happen inside the, uh, the brain and making a machine to do that, okay, taking cue from multiple sensors which give you different types of data is, is amazing. It's, it's, it's like very, very complex science. So all these things are possible thanks to deep learning. Now, I'll just show one small example which which actually sort of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, tells you how, how far this has advanced. So what I'm seeing here is, is a terrain. It could be a, with a lot of rocks and climbs and and, uh, and downfalls and things like that. And you have, you see an animated character, right? Earlier, what used to happen is that to make a movie which wherein this this character has to run or walk through this terrain, people used to animate each step of the of the of the vehicle, of the of the of the character, right? Now, but let's say you need to walk through this terrain. Okay, you will learn to walk. You would have learned. Right? The terrain could be anything. It could be with these bumps or it could be with a different bump, it could be with a climb or it could be a dive in the water, whatever it is. Because you are human beings, because you have learned to walk, you don't have to be as a human being, you don't have to be animated for each terrain that you are walking, right? Can this be done through a machine? Can I create a mannequin which can learn to walk, right? And give it any terrain. It could be this terrain or it could be some other terrain, it could be any other terrain. Once I have done the machine learning model, once I have done the deep learning model, can it learn to walk? And all you have to do is walk your model is like fully mature. You give it any terrain and you don't have to do the animation, it will learn by itself. I mean, that's what has been achieved today. I mean, this is an amazing thing, all I'm telling you. Obviously, you need to defend the release of freedom of the hand and the, um, on the, on the, on the legs, otherwise, it, it, if it goes uh, unnaturally, it don't look good. So, let's just have a look at this. Um, if we just uh, run, press the play button, then yeah. So it's interesting, just a few seconds, just look at it, yeah. So, see, this is learned, okay, this is not animated. The way the, the mannequin bends and moves and turns around and things like this is learned. So, suddenly, right, this is interesting. Look how it, it tries to walk through the ledge. Right? How I would use my hands to get more balance, that's what the, the mining also does. Anyway, alright. So, all these, so let's get a bit deeper into technology now. So, all these things are possible, as I said earlier, thanks to the techniques which are also called as artificial neural networks. Okay? Which are, which are basically, actually, they are trying to mimic the way human brain works. Now, this is a very interesting slide. This sort of shows how the, the neural uh, network, the complexity of the neural networks has, has rapidly evolved over the recent past. For example, in 2015, many of you might be aware that the biggest network at that time happened to be Microsoft ResNet. And that, that used 60 million parameters, hyperparameters to be, uh, to be uh, uh, deployed in that model. And the very next year, uh, the biggest network of that year happened to be the Baidu Digitrix. There are two different domains. I mean, please get the message clearly. Biggest networks of those respective years is what is represented here. And that changed the way speech worked. A lot of you who are working in speech will be aware of it. I'm sure you are using it also. 
and then 2017 Google in empty uh, became the biggest one. Now, look at the way the, the computational needs have grown over a period of time. What needed 7 exaflops in 2015 needed 100 exaflops in, in 2017, the biggest model of that the respective year. And 16 million parameters needed 8,700 million parameters. That is the way the complexity has, has, has evolved in the, in, 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 at a breakneck speed in, in, in every year. Now, the next, the big thing today in this technology is what we call as complexity AI, which is very, very, very complex, right? I mean, it is, I mean, when, when I make a query or when I talk over the phone to, 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 to the other person, uh, to the other party who is sitting on the other side, it should be so natural that I shouldn't be able to identify whether the other person uh, it's a machine or a human being, right? The, the person on the other side. That's what we mean by conversation AI. And it is a very, very, very complex thing, extremely contextual. Contextual. I mean, it depends on the queries that I submit are extremely contextual and has to be there. The context has to be understood. It is not understanding the word or the language. The context has to be understood and a, and a smooth conversation needs to happen. And the, the, the biggest uh, um, Development in the recent past in this particular area is what we call as BERT, B E R T. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of I'm seeing a lot of heads nodding. It looks I'm very happy to see that. Um, how many of you are using BERT or heard about BERT? Wow, wow. Okay, <laughs> that's like 50 percentage of the audience. That's really good. Also, I'm I'm, I'm sure you under, you understand and appreciate how how big the development of BERT um, in the recent past and, and their contribution to the area of uh, of NLP. Now, now look at the complexity of Word here. When I'm talking about word large, I'm talking about 340 million parameters. And GPT-2 uses 1.5 million parameters. And I don't know how many of you have heard when people are using word also. There's a big project called Project Megatron, which is coming up, which is using 8.3 billion parameters attached to the model. This essentially means that the models are extraordinarily getting complex. Right? They are becoming deeper, they are becoming denser, and they are becoming extraordinarily complex. Now, is this an unnecessary complexity that we are introducing to ourselves to, to, in our lives? <coughs> Absolutely no. The, the tweaks that you need to do to make a neural network go from, let's say, 80% accuracy to 85% accuracy is relatively easier than making it to go from 90% to 90.3%. Right? From make, to make it go from 95 percentage to 95.01 percent, the tweaks, the number of parameters you need to tune, is much, much more complex than what you used to do from 80 to 85 percentage. Right? So, and we are not happy with 80 percentage, we are not happy with 93 percentage, we are not happy with 95 percentage. I'm sure a lot of you are parents and we are never happy with 95 marks that our kid gets, right? We always want them to get 100. I mean, thankfully, this being a stochastic modeling technique is never going to be 100, but still, right? Okay, now, so, in order, so this is a necessity. This is no longer a luxury. This is a necessity. If you want to build an AI-first company, if you want to roll out AI as a production environment, you want to deploy it for actual use cases, not for experimenting in the labs or and feeling happy about the results that you're hearing on the headphone, inside your data center, inside your office. No, I want AI to be deployed for my customers. I want AI to be a practice in my organization. This becomes a need, okay? And having this in the background, I mean, this type of complexity, how do I manage and how do I build an AI-first company is what we are going to talk about. But it's just not the complexity of the model that we are talking about, that we have talked about. It also is the type of neural networks that have that have born in the recent past. Look at this. I mean, with the first two columns, I'm sure you are very familiar. The traditional ones, the CNNs and the RNNs, the images and the time series, they have been there for like several decades now. And then there are many, many novel new new networks that have been born. GANs have changed the way CNNs have been working. And that help in, in, in taking the accuracy to, 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 to by frog leaps to much better um, uh, areas of domain. And then reinforcement learning, and there are, there are several new species. I think the, the image is not clear. I'm not going to read to them. But then uh, many of them might you might not have even heard. Many of us would not have even heard about them. But once again, like, like what I have been telling, the, the the area of deep learning, machine learning is 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 growing in leaps and bounds thanks to the big interest that the industry has generated. A lot of 
research and development is happening here and that is what is, is, is resulting in, in so much of development happening in this area at a breakneck speed. Right. Now, so A platform considerations. What, what, should, what should I consider? What are the, the most basic considerations I need to have if I want to build an AI first company? The first one is product, develop the productivity. I'm sure all of us are very happy about it. The, this particular community is expensive, right, compared to others. I and mean, of course, in India, we still continue to be cheaper when compared to our Western counterparts. But then, this particular you know, community is expensive. And scaling the performance. Always, that guy, an enterprise starts with, with experimentation. Always, it starts with one or two top use cases that are going to have that impact on its business model and then make it pervasive over the organization. Nobody switches off the current methods of working and goes on to the newer methods of working uh, overnight. So, how do I scale a performance? Scale, scale the adoption. How do I start small? But very quickly, I build an elastic infrastructure that, that helps me to, to, to move across multiple workflows that are possible. Right? So, I'm going to use the term infrastructure many times in the next 10, 10 15 minutes time. One overarching statement I want to make here is that when I say infrastructure, I do not mean only the hardware. Okay? I do not mean only the hardware. There's a lot of software that goes into it, and that's what I mean by infrastructure. It's hardware plus software. And of course, total cost of ownership. All of us are, are worried about money. How do I build an infrastructure which can help in AI computing, which can help me in storing huge amounts of data, but under, under my budget? Let's, let's talk about that. So basically, there are many considerations that are there. there. And the, basic, the, the, the idea here is to build an infrastructure that scales. That's very, very, very important. Because I assure you, the moment you start deploying AI in your organization, in a successful way, you are only going to run out of space. Okay, your data is going to grow bigger. You will never be happy with, your, with the, the volume of data. You want to have more, and hence the compute needs are also going to increase. So, if, if you need an infrastructure that sustain you for at least five years and which can scale. And this is a very interesting one. If you can read through the box on the left hand side, I don't want to bore you by reading through the numbers here. But basically, the the, the idea here is that uh, if I take autonomous driving as an example, the amount of data that is generated and the, the amount of compute that is needed to, for, for running one neural network is, is, is brutal, is brutal. And there are many, many neural networks that run in a car, in an autonomous car, right? So, the idea is to, is, is, is to ensure that you adopt reference architectures that help you to scale, okay? Scaling is an extremely important consideration that you want to have. And then comes the million dollar question, which is a very popular question that everybody asks. Do I go for the, go the cloud way or do I go on prem? Right? So the answer is simple. I mean, it's not very complicated. I'd say the answer is simple. Any exploration, you want to play around with, with things. You, you have a workforce who want to understand what machine learning is, what deep learning is. They want to experiment. They know they just take a pre trained model, um, put your, uh, uh, your own data, and see how it works, playing around with no intention of deploying it for actual production needs, cloud is a good way to start with, right? Because it gives you oh, 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 the flexibility only to do a few experimentations, right? I mean, I, one of the gentlemen was asking, I think, from this side, if it's going to be, it's going to be expensive, right? But if you are interested in a, to move out of the learning phase, to move out of the, the playing around phase, you want to deploy it, for actual business needs, either for your internal customers or for your external customers to whom you are selling. Uh, selling to on-prem has to be the right solution, right? Because it gives you multiple advantages. Number one, it gives you the ability to play around with large data sets which are of relevance to you, okay? Not the data sets which are there already there at the use plan. Number two, it, it allows you to play with they do a lot of experimentation. I mean, you can experiment a lot when you have your own infrastructure, right? And uh, um, I mean, uh, if, you, if you recall a couple of slides, what we talked, discussed about, there are many, many newer methodologies of working that are coming into play. Okay, just by increasing the batch sizes, you could get a big improvement in the in the, in the model accuracy. Just by increasing the number of epochs that you run, you may be you may be able to run. And I talked about millions of parameters, millions of epoch parameters to be tuned, right? How do I play around with that? I mean, I want to do a lot of experimentation. I want to, I want to find out which works best for me. And we are not talking about one model. One model is not going to work. 
the way AI is working obviously is an ensemble of models, right? How do I create an ensemble of models and how do I make them all work? To, to do that, you need an on-prem AI infrastructure that scales, okay? Which, which, which is able to start off slowly and able to quickly adapt, just keep, keep on adding to it uh, the way you want it without losing um, the, the goodness of whatever you had, you had acquired a few, a few months or a few years ago. So that is that would be my recommendation if you are going to ask me this question. Okay, nothing wrong about both the solutions. It will be very clear as what is your objective. You want to play around and um, that's, that's a good way to start off with. Right? I hope I answered that question. Alright, now how, let's quickly move on to the software side of it. Alright, so this is a, a, a high level overview of uh, the software ecosystem that goes into an AI data center. All right. At the bottom of everything is what we can call as accelerated platforms. Okay. Basically, it's run on GPUs. And uh, the, the biggest difference between many of you, I'm sure 90% of you know this, the, the biggest difference between a GPU infrastructure and a CPU infrastructure is that a GPU allows you to take a large problem, very large problem, break it down into a large number of small threads and run them in parallel. Parallelization, a high performance computing. This is the very essence of accelerated computing. Okay. On top of that lies the, the, the what we call as the CUDA, which is computer unified device architecture, which is our software parallelization framework. Okay. Everything has to be parallelized, but there has to be one backbone, one underlying software that enables you to do the parallelization in the most efficient way. And that, that, uh, that layer is what we call as CUDA. And on top of that lies a lot of buckets of very, very specialized and very elegant refine the set of software, right? And there are packets for deep learning, there are packets for machine learning, there are packets for high-performance computing, the traditional HPC, and of course, virtualization of, of GPUs, etc. And all these small boxes that you are seeing here, these are like, they are like, I mean, I'm, we could do two hours only on, on, on each of these boxes, but then, basically, the idea here is that these are specialized software that make your life easier, right? To, to ensure that you concentrate on what you are supposed to be doing, which is building models, refining the models, and getting the best out of it, and not only about underlying, about the underlying software or, or what what makes it run the way it is supposed to run. And on top of that, rise of the, the the most uh, favorite, uh, you know, framework of uh, uh, most favorite uh, layer for all of us, which is the frameworks layer, which is I mean I'm sure we are familiar with all these names, the TensorFlow, the PyTorch, and the and they can ask us carousels of the world, as Microsoft CNDK, etc, etc. So this is like amazing thing. I mean, the frameworks have made the lives of, of all of us very, very easy. And the good thing here is that, as a developer who is work, who, whose job is to create models that, that address the topmost layers, the application layer, you don't have to worry about anything below this, right? It is just the robustness that is needed. The frameworks take care of most of the functionalities that are there. For, for, for running your AI and deep learning workflows. Now, it is just not training. I mean, this is a very important point that I would like all of you to, to keep it in mind. It's just not the training. Thanks to the evolution of the technology, so far the, the concentration has only been on the training. But now we are slowly moving towards adoption, towards deployment, inferencing. And that is going to be an even bigger need than it comes to training. Okay. Now, this is a very complex thing when it comes to software. The reason is that is this. Then I'm, I'm going to talk about, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about multiple libraries, each of them, um, you know, addressing multiple other domains. Uh, but, but then, the idea here is to ensure that all of you are aware of such fantastic libraries that are available in the world and, and start making use of them. Right. And all the software, okay, all the software that I'm going, I have talked about and I'm going to talk about is free. Okay, that's, that's the good thing about this science. And maybe that's the reason it has, it has, it has evolved also so fast and it continues to evolve at this, this speed is that none of the software you need to buy. Right? That, that's amazing. So it's important that you are aware of this, make use of them in your workflows, okay? And then get, and then start building your AI for organization. Now, one library which, have, which is of utmost important that I'd like to talk about is what we call as tensor learning. Okay? Now, your training happens in the data center. Very powerful machines are there, supercomputers are there, so training happens extremely, extraordinarily well. But when does the deployment happen? Deployment happens on, let's say, face recognition problems, a very common problem today. 
on the, on the railway platforms, on the police shops, on the uh, signals on the road, where you don't have huge infrastructure to support these models. So how do we translate an extremely heavy model, creating the data center, which gives me 93.6 percentage accuracy, I'm very happy about it, into an inferenceable model, into a much lighter weight model, which can be deployed at the edge, on site. That translation from a heavy trained model to an inferencing model is done through this library which is called Stress Lab. Okay. Make use of them. It does fantastic things. And then, um, one more um, um, library which, which I would really like to you guys to use is what we call Deep Stream SDK, which is a video analytics, image and video analytics tool. Okay. Many things, most of the repetitive things that you will be doing on or when you are running uh, uh, an, uh, an IDA problem, an intelligent video analytics problem, they are all available here. Pre-trained models, data sets, um, most commonly used libraries, SDKs, etc. They are all available. I would like to draw your attention to the top box, which gives you typical use cases which are being used. And hence, most of, you don't have to, basically, you don't have to start from ground zero. You're not starting from a clean whiteboard and start writing everything all, to, all by yourself. You start building on a base, okay, on, 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 on a template, and then it is not that you just put your, you put your data, run it, and you get the results, absolutely no. Okay. You need to customize a lot. You need to use transferring toolkits, etc., to, to customize the model to what you want to achieve for your data set and for your intention. Having said that, these type of libraries allow you to, to start from a base and not start from a clean whiteboard. There are many um, uh, segment for focused um, packages also. Okay, one such thing. I mean, I'll talk for a few of them. Healthcare. Um, how I you know how many of you are working in healthcare segment in this large audience? But then there is a package called Media Clara, C L E R. Okay, so this is a package which is specifically meant for people who are working on uh, in the healthcare segment for deep brain problems using deep brain problems for. Uh, for medical imaging and the diagnosis and things like that. And there are extremely good models and uh, data sets that are available, which is, this is, this is a big problem uh, in this particular area. And uh, I have one, one very important, uh, you know, uh, this is sort of a breakdown into, 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 the, uh, uh, into the package, uh, is, is what we call as Transfer Learning Toolkit, TLTK, okay? Because the, the, the pre-trained models, maybe for an organ identification or segmentation, etc. Whatever is available would have to be created using one particular data set. How do I transfer it to a data set? Uh, how do I transfer it to something which, which is applicable to me? And that is done through a lot of uh, TLTK, where we done through a lot of uh, tools uh, called Transfer Learning Toolkit, which helps you to migrate what is uh, ready-made to, to, to suit your needs. So, we have multiple such things. For example, a AI assisted annotation is, is a big thing in, in medical imaging. Mm -hmm. Once again, I would like to re, re emphasize here is that all the software that I am talking about here, they are available free. Okay? You don't have to buy any of them. If you have the right infrastructure in terms of the hardware, all you have to do is get them and start using them. Right? And similarly, if you are into image and video analytics, there is a, there's a package called the Metropolis. Which, which helps you to run video analytics at stage, right? Now, let's change gears a little bit. So, so far we have talked a lot about deep learning, but what happens to machine learning, okay? The traditional machine learning, okay? It is not that it's going to die in the near future, right? It's, it's going to continue to be there forever, it is my, 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 my guess, right? So, the, the, all these accelerated computing techniques, the, the huge techniques that I talked about, are they applicable for traditional machine learning techniques also? The answer is yes. Because the, the research that has been happening in the deep learning area has quickly you know, spread across over to the traditional machine learning techniques also. right? And that package is what is called as RAPEX, or APADS, RAPEX. Okay? So if you're using any of the traditional machine learning techniques or packages like um, you could be on Pandas, you could be on Skykit Learn, um, NumPy, whatever you are doing today, please do try Rapix, or APIDS, Rapix. And that is an amazing toolkit which helps you to accelerate your traditional data sciences workflow, your traditional machine learning, your traditional ETL, the, uh, the extract transfer and loading of your data, your graph analytic tools, whatever you have been doing is traditional techniques, how do you do it in an accelerated way? 
that is what Rapids helps you to do. All right. So from data preparation uh, to uh, running your machine learning algorithms, the traditional machine learning algorithms, we'll be talking about the list a little later, to your uh, creating the graph analytics, I mean, I'm visualizing the results. If I'm doing a real-time visualization of results, all these things are now migrating to a much, much faster GPU accelerated way, and that is done through Rapids, right? For example, if you're using Pandas, okay, for defining your data frames, right? All you have to do is, it's not that you need to throw your Pandas code, absolutely no. Just change, in, in, instead of importing Pandas library, you change the first two lines and import Rapids library, library. And your existing Pandas code will continue to work the way it works without any change in the line. Right? Right? So, uh, similarly for machine learning, I mean, I'm sure you are using all these things, things right? I mean, you must be using all, if not, um, I mean, not even a few of them, all of them you must be using. So. Using the library which is called as UML, CUML, I mean, uh, which is part of Rapids, you are able, you will be able to accelerate these type of libraries also, uh, 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 run it on GPUs in a much accelerated way. Okay. Now, um, the when I say accelerate, I, I kept using the terms uh, term accelerated multiple times, right, over the past several minutes. What do you mean by accelerated? I mean, will I be able to quantify that? When I say accelerated computing, okay, if a problem has been running for, let us say, four days, it takes four days to solve, and through accelerated computing techniques, I am not talking about bringing down four days to two days. I am not talking about bringing four days to one day. I am not talking about bringing four days to 24 hours, one day. I am talking about bringing four days to something like four hours or three hours, right? That is what I mean by accelerated computing. It is just not uh, making it a half or a quarter of a, uh, uh, time than what it was running earlier. It is like huge levels of acceleration. For example, XG boost, which is a very common booster technique, uh, booster tree technique, uh, which many of you might be using. It shows amazing acceleration when you are using the library called Rapids on GPUs. Okay, and I have I have personally seen results like when when problems that have run for uh, days coming down to few hours. So, so basically that is what we mean by accelerated techniques. So by accelerating it this way, it is just not the fun of seeing what runs for 4 hours comes down to 2 to 4 days comes down to 2 hours. I mean, how does it matter? Maybe I have the luxury to let it run for 4 days, who cares? And 4 days is not a big, a big time anyways. No, it's not that. The ability to, to compute more, the ability to use more amount of data will ensure that your workflows, your deep learning workflows, your machine learning workflows changes. You'll be experimenting with your models, you'll be experimenting with your data sets, you'll be running much more hyperparameters, you'll be using larger batch sizes, you'll be running more iterations, more epochs, etc. Et and hence, the workflow, the elegance of your machine learning platform that you're building for our organization will change for good, for the better, right? That is what is this is, is adoption of AI in a much more efficient way. It's just not the time that is, um, it's not that, I mean, four comes to, I mean, um, without changing anything, it's not that. I mean, I hope I'm able to convey whatever I want to convey. So basically, to sum it up, basically, there are libraries which, 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 which accelerate the entire data sciences pipeline, okay? From ETL to defining data frames, to running your machine learning codes. When I say machine learning, the traditional machine learning codes like, like boost entries and SVMs and things like that, and of course deep learning, which, which goes without saying, and then running your graph analytic techniques, visualization of results in, in real time. All these things are now getting accelerated through the techniques that I talk about on GPUs. Right. So, what so, for running large problems, the traditional data sciences cluster used to look like this until about two, three years ago. Okay, you need to, like large machines, the, uh, clusters of large machines to run. Thanks to all these developments that I talked about, what war used to look like this is now this. Okay, and this is achieved through GPU accelerated AI supercomputers. Okay, that's the message I want to leave here, and uh, so. Before, okay, 
and actor. Okay. So the the cost of compute also has come down drastically if you want to run large problems on AI and machine learning and deep learning. Okay. Because of this reason, if you had needed something like this until about two or three years ago, okay, by adopting the newer techniques, the newer GPU accelerating techniques, by adopting the newer AI supercomputing system, there are specific systems, the DJX systems which you might have heard about, which are AI supercomputing systems. By adopting them, you will be able to save a lot of costs, not only in the, in the initial investment, but also obviously in terms of the running costs also. I mean, so running something like this is going to cost you much, much higher than running something like this. Right? So that is the way computation has evolved in the recent past. Right. So, what did, we talk, what did we talk about? We talked about the way the technology has evolved, we talked about the complexities that have run, gotten into the technology, and we talked about how an, a scalable A infrastructure is extraordinarily important if you want to build an AI first organization. And then we talked about the importance of the supporting software that are there for, any, for making this infrastructure run. We talked about a few of those factors. I just touched upon a few. There is a bigger list, much longer list, for which I don't have, obviously, I don't have time. We have talked about, uh, uh, you know, TensorRT, we talked about DTM SDK, we talked about Clara, we talked about a few of the conversation AI word part of it, and then we quickly moved on to Rapids, which is which helps you to accelerate your entire data sciences pipeline, irrespective of whether you are using the modern deep learning techniques or you are sticking to the conventional, traditional machine learning techniques or a combination of both, and how the AI infrastructure has evolved over the recent past. Right? And that's what I wanted to talk to you. I think I have three more minutes. Uh, for a few questions. Yes, go ahead. Does NVIDIA have innovative models in terms of shared ownership? Shared ownership of infrastructure? No, we don't. Uh, we don't offer any cloud services. We don't do that at all. All the, uh, the CSPs like Amazon and the other two, I mean, all of them do offer GP enabled cloud services. NVIDIA by themselves does not, does not offer any cloud cloud based infrastructure. Okay. Uh, who would uh, I be connecting with if I have to work on the total cost of which I need to design architecture for a client of mine? You can, I mean, we have a large team here. We have Ashutosh visiting right here. And in fact, we have a stall right outside this this, um, this auditorium with our experts there. In fact, there are time, I mean, uh, the, 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 the software that I talked about, like TensorRT, DeepStream SDK, etc., there are live demonstrations and uh, snippets that are being shown by our data scientists. Walk over there and talk to anyone of us, you'll be able to help. I, I, I'm also around until, at least until about 2 o'clock today. You can catch me as well. And uh, to all of you, uh, talk to me if you are interested uh, to know a little bit more than what has been spoken on the stage. Um, Intel was also coming up with accelerated computing. Uh, they had introduced a few Python libraries, but the breadth was not there. But as I see in your presentation, NVIDIA has come up with a complete breadth of offerings. For the community which does initial development during the training days when they work on CPUs, do it, does this library of Rapids work on CPU also? Rapids works on GPUs. Okay. Rapids works on GPUs. But if you may have heard your code on, let's say, Pandas, as Kagit one, right? Whatever you created, your legacy code, all you have to do is, let's say, let's take the case of Pandas for different data types. All you have to do is take your existing code, change the first two lines, instead of importing Pandas, you imp uh, uh, Pandas library imports QDF, and, and the existing code works uh, as it is on GPU. And also, do you have any, uh, like uh, Amazon comes up with user guides or uh, developer guides, you have uh, material on Google uh, which lot, is... Lot, lot. So uh, you have to go and look at a resource called as NVIDIA GPU Cloud. Okay, it's not a cloud infrastructure. I mean, the name could be a little misleading. It's a software repository that gives you extraordinarily good documentation. Obviously, that's a need. So much good doc sorry, documentation is available. And having said that, once again, the migration, is easy. I mean, of course, you need to read documentation. I'm not pushing it away. Good documentation available and migration is easy. 